Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. Welcome everybody to another episode of Investing Insights with Right Property Group. I nearly forgot our own name then. There you go. Uh, with with uh, Victor Kumar and Steve Waters. And once again, a lot of, a lot of stuff's been happening, Vic. Um, data is up, data is down, data is sideways. A bit of confirmational bias in there from many, many different parties. And we're going to lean into a subject today that on the surface, I can just see it now, the heading on the podcast is going to seem very, very boring and probably a little too deep for people like you and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, it's such a cornerstone of, of success in whatever you do in life. And that is all about your own psychology, but more so the psychology of investing. And you could probably break it down and piecemeal it out into all different asset classes. But today we're going to lean into real estate because that's what we do. Uh, but before we get to it, Vic, about the psychology of investing, what's been happening? Well, Steve, I'm a bit deflated, right? So first of all, um, I I can see that you are fashionably late today. And <laughs> uh, I, 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 I was fishing for the perfect sledge and I put up a post on Facebook uh, to say, hey, give me a, a, um, a sledge. Uh, yet no one arrived. I think I left it a little bit too late. So if you're listening, um, even though it is a little bit uh, after the fact, go onto Facebook. What and, a sledge uh, for me! And uh, get a get me a sledge for Steve that I can use for the next podcast. I mean, that, that'll really make my day. <laughs> so um, apart from that, Steve, <laughs> I've, I've um, I'm just looking at the Facebook now. <laughs> All it is. So Victor's become <laughs> a finfluencer, insta famous in his own right. He's put up a photo of what he had for breakfast. Which I couldn't finish. Which he couldn't finish. And how you can sledge me today. You've had one comment from Melissa. Yeah, she's old faithful. Yeah, it just says that looks delicious and I'm sure she's talking about the food. (laughs) Not you or me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, but we digress as usual. We do. Yep. Uh, It could be a show about... Well, it's actually, it's probably not because the psychology is you're trying to mess with my head. It is, it is. And, and uh, you know, the economy, the interest rate. And when, when you look at what's really happened, right? So uh, a few fun facts. Um, but from COVID till now, which is arguably three years ago, um, the average national property price has gone up circa 42%. The last 12 months, so uh, the annual um, number of sales is down by 21%. So that's got to mess with anyone's head, right? So we've had a big rise and now no one's selling. There's this uh, big um, stick hanging over our heads to say, okay, have we reached the peak of the market in terms of interest rates or not? And why aren't there any properties for me to buy if I can qualify for finance? Mm. And it all messes with a lot of people's heads. Absolutely. And, and some people then pull the trigger a bit too early. Others start procrastinating. Um, and um, more so that are not informed, I just caught like a deer in the headlights that just don't know what to do. They just get stuck in their portfolio and, and um, arguably this is where in market phases like this, you and I have made our most money. I was only saying that to a journo the other day about it, it, has this cycle shaped or has it been shaped by anything that's happened in the past, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be great markets or perhaps not so good markets and, and the like. And my initial answer was no, nothing really has changed because, you know, I have a path, I have a theory and I implement. Mm-hmm. You stay the course. I stay the course, yeah. right? However, as I sort of garbed that out in the back of my mind, I was still thinking and I thought, no, well, hang on, some things have shaped when, and it, but it's more about how hard mm. you go or yep. or how um, soft you go. So mm-hmm. do I consolidate for this period mm-hmm. or do I buy as much as I can in whatever the asset class is? And if we, we continually talk about there's always a crisis. Yes. Right? So if you're one of those in uh, – if you're the type of imper- person, um, brackets, investor, that – is really reactive to a crisis in the negative, well, you probably shouldn't be investing mm-hmm. because there's so many components that will just not let you sleep at night. But if you have this long-term horizon and 
you have your plan and you have a way to execute it, then they're just, I guess, moments in time. And so, as we've talked about before, these different crises, so we've obviously had COVID. Yep. Good time to buy, some would argue. Um, end of APRA. Good time to buy. Good time to, to buy. Or even during APRA, mm-hmm. perhaps, is a better way to describe it. Uh, the tail end of the GFC. Certainly a good time to buy. Yeah. Um, the uh, end of the low doc home loan or the beginning, whichever way you want to look at it, mm-hmm. I guess, and so on and so forth. Like That's just in our lifetime mm-hmm. of investing. Now, we're not suggesting for one minute that just because it's a crisis, you should just go all in. There's, yeah. there's obviously a very methodical and strategic way that we approach that as individuals on our own circumstances. Mm-hmm. But if we fast forward from each of those crises, there's always been an upside. Absolutely. And, and one of the things we, you know, I've learned over the years is that never does 100% of all of the tick boxes get ticked. As long, as long as we've got 80% of it ticked and we've mitigated the risk for the 20% that we've left unticked, so we've looked at the pros and cons uh, and the worst case scenario, it is safe to jump in. A- and usually, um, whether it's a up market, down market, sideways market, it's just a small um, uh, adjustment of strategy, but more importantly, a big adjustment in terms of your psychology to continue investing or to actually stop investing. It's a really good point. At the end of the day, it, it, it is the market is between our ears, as mm-hmm. we've always said, and that whole psychological component around whether we pull a trigger or, or we don't has such heavy weight on our decision making mm. process. All those what ifs, and it's always around fear. Yeah. A, at the end of the uncertainty. day, uncertainty. Yeah, or well, uncertainty is perhaps a, a softer way to describe it, and it's the truth because we can sit back and we say, well, "What if?" and "What if?" and "What if?" On the other side of the ledger, though, you get the, I guess, the what if, the what if, the what if, if I don't get into the market mm. and you have that whole FOMO yep. effect. It's almost like a bookend approach. There's never a there's never a, uh, a, a period of normalness. No. The, I mean, there is, but most people think that there isn't. It's either boom or it's bust. It's never just doing its thing. And it reminds me of um, the, the some interesting stats and I, and. Don't hold me to being a one hundred percent accurate here. Eighty uh, percent? No, no, about the US, <laughs> the US uh, stock market. Mm-hmm. That yeah, if you if you had just invested in it and done nothing, so even during those booms and bust periods and the heightened um, and elevated market returns, and then the busts, mm-hmm. if you had just purchased and did nothing, it was about eight percent per annum. Yep. Right now, there's obviously massive fluctuations in there. Mm-hmm. Those that tried to play the market because of their own, I guess, behavioural biases, who were in, oh, it's going to crash, I'm going to get out, oh, it's a good time to buy, I'm going to get in, and they, this whole topsy-turvy approach, they got a return of around about 3.8% percent over, the, the, over the whole time, right? Yep. Because you can't, you can't time the market explicitly. Mm-hmm. You can't do it perfectly, whether in or, or out. And I guess that's the beauty of our asset class because it's very clunky to get in and it's even clunkier to get out. Which uh, irons out the upheavals. Correct. Yeah. Unless you're a, a speculative investor. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to try and time the market perfectly. I'll get in, I'll get out and you know, go back to and listen to the podcast around our time in and timing the market and how most people get it wrong. Um, so, But when you, when you understand the, the asset class into whatever you're investing – and you should understand it, you should be absolutely meticulous in the way that you educate yourself on it, It's the because it's clunky, mm-hmm. it gives us that, I guess, that elongated time piece to be able to reap the rewards. Yep. But if you're a panicker on the purchasing side or the selling side, you're going to miss out on so much mm. upside and you'll, you, you'll give yourself tumours just overanalyzing it. And I think that's part of the psychological problem with investing in whatever the asset class is people take what it could be perceived as a big problem and the solution that they find to it has to be so complicated just to match the size of the potential problem when it it's not that at all Mm -hmm. it's a very uncomplicated approach if you want it to be that's right that's right so we want to take a a rather simplistic approach towards investing. Don't make it complicated because the more complicated you make it, 
the more variables there are, uh, and, and some of those variables aren't really pertinent at all. Uh, they're out of your control. Investing. Yeah, they're way out of your control. And we also need to be taking a medium-term approach to property, right? So that what that does, it keeps you safe during the times when everyone's going mad and buying, a la the COVID period. Uh, it also keeps you safe when people are fearful, uh, as in right now. Now, they're not necessarily fearful because of um, the way property market is shaping out. It's more so the external factors of inflation's high, the... Um, no, the fastness or the, or the rapidity of, of interest rate rise has been the uh, highest it's been uh, or the fastest it's been in the last 70 odd years. Right? Headline grabbing. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of so when, when you see those headlines, it does put uh, you know, fear uh, into play. Or you could look at it uh, the, on the reverse side of the coin and say, okay, what are the opportunities here? And how can I adjust my way of thinking, my approach to investing to actually capitalize on today's market, as opposed to doing the same old thing, even though uh, the, the play has changed, you're still having the same approach, and therefore that's when you actually lose money and lose opportunities as well. Would you say that's from a lack of understanding, though? Um, the yes, yes. Of it the would pieces? Be. Yeah, yeah, of the pieces. Yeah. yeah. Understanding what, what the pieces are at play. And also, um, uh, the other thing is also uh, running in after the hordes to say, okay, if everyone is doing this, I, they must be right and therefore I'll do the same as well. Uh, and not taking into account your own individual financial fingerprint to say that this is these are the cards that I've been dealt to play with, and therefore they are. Uh, I, I need to know whether to fold, whether to hold. Um, how do I play this game out? So here's a question then, because it's, it's once again, it, it gets to be confirmational bias mm -hmm. on whatever you're searching for, and the algorithms will just throw it up at you, right? Yep. So if you're a positive of a positive nature in terms of where we are today and, and, and investing the algorithms of let's call it life mm -hmm. so we don't get censored um that'll be thrown up to you but if you were on the other side it'll that'll throw up to Absolute you table. as well really good example actually and i'm not sure if you heard it heard about it but the 15th biggest bank i think in the u.s um so fractionally smaller than anz our anz mm -hmm. just went broke so, in a, and because I searched that, because I read about it on YouTube, I've just been smashed mm -hmm. with, you know, we all know it, how it works and it goes that way, right? But the amount of garb that's been thrown my way now about the entire banking system and how it's all going to collapse and so on and so on and so on. If you weren't mentally strong enough, you would buy into that. Absolutely. And you there'd be no helping to mm -hmm. it. So I actually sort of deleted and cleared the whatever you do in the back end so I wouldn't get thrown up that stuff, right? But the same goes with, the, say, with property in today's environment. Let's just, like, keep it local from an Australian point of view rather than a worldwide scenario. There wouldn't be a day goes past where there is not several, I guess, um, I was going to say <laughs> several really bad headlines, mm -hmm. you know, with doomsday. Yet, if you were to sit back and take an educated approach to that and an educated understanding to that, you would have to realise that there is a better than not chance that 95% of the headlines will not come true. Yep. Just because of the background pieces that are in, that are in play. And I guess in... Most of all, humans have a tendency to take the unlikely events, dare I say it, too seriously mm -hmm. and look for a reason why it's going to happen. And I guess the very first one with that, and let's just rattle off a few points here. These are what I think anyways in around the psychology of, it, of investing and how to actually tune yourself so that you can make solid decisions rather than fearful decisions. And those fearful decisions can be fear of not getting in or fear of not getting out. The first one is you need to establish and identify your own relationship with debt. Mm, really important. The, the most important, important yeah. one. Yeah. Because that, that gives you a sleep at night factor as well, doesn't it? Well, it's all around debt, isn't it? Mm. So whether the market's going great, debt, debt, debt. Whether the market's going bad, debt, debt, debt. How am I going to pay it back? How can I afford it? And what do you think about debt? So that relation, 
that that understanding your own relationship with debt is ever so important. Your relationship with debt is different than mine. Yep. And that's factual. You're yep. probably more on the affirmative side. And I still have the hangover of my parents, mm-hmm. yeah, to some degree. <laughs> but I understand that it's a that it's a tool, right? And so everybody's relationship with debt, once you get that understanding, you'll be far more comfortable in the way that you approach anything. And if you don't get an understanding, well, then you shouldn't do anything. Yeah, absolutely. And and to, to um, uh, latch back on to a comment I made, made earlier, which is you need to keep things simple. And the simplicity of debt is, is this. It's how many dollars per week do you need to control the zeros? And if you can get that around your head, it makes life so much more easier and then y- you don't have that sleepless nights because you know that regardless of whether you owe a million dollars or regardless of whether you owe a hundred million dollars, it's the dollar amount per week you need to come up with to hold onto that debt, right? And that also uh, highlights that someone may be in a far worse position holding a, say, 150K debt as opposed to a million dollar debt hi- held by someone else because of Guess what? Cash flow. Do you know, it's, and oh, there's another psychological piece of the puzzle, I guess. You know, once again, you've said debt equals cash flow in or out. Mm-hmm. Right? Essentially, that's what it yep. comes down to. How many podcasts, how many times during podcasts have we talked about that? Mm. Like, I can imagine the listener now going, oh, here we go again, the whole cash flow scenario. But it, it is at the absolute epicenter. I think it's the oxygen of investing. Of every, well, 100% it is. If you haven't got the cash flow, you could have all the debt in the world. You have nothing because you'll yep. become a statistic as we often refer to it. But that that zeros that you mentioned is one person could have four zeros at the end of their debt position. Someone could have 24 zeros mm-hmm. at the end of their debt position. It's, dare I say it? Irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yeah. It's just how do I manage that? Now, so that brings me to a point though around what the headlines are saying and whether the headlines are being perpetuated by the banking system, the government or whoever else in between about this interest rate, Mm -hmm. fixed rate cliff, which equals cash flow. Yeah. The cash flow position once again. Now, as we've mentioned before, there is a real, there is a real risk there, or it's not even a risk. It will be absolute that there are going to be some people that struggle Mm -hmm. at the end of that cliff because they're coming from 1.99 to five and a half yep. percent or whatever it Which they be. haven't budgeted for. Which they haven't budgeted for at the beginning, mm-hmm. yeah, which was mistake number one. Mistake number two is that they hadn't budgeted for it halfway between when they first implemented and now. Mm. So there's been 10 rate rises. You could have started to budget and make the necessary moves six Way months ahead. ago, yep. eight months ago or whatever it may be. Um, so there is going to be an element of hurt in there but why i bring that up and sorry and for a lot of other people it it won't be Mm -hmm. and that's already been proved in the people that have already rolled off that fixed rate over the last say eight months yep yeah into a higher rate environment but why i think it's such an an important psychological piece is that those that struggle with it are going to be psychologically scarred Mm. for many many years to come Now, there'd be an element of those people that were investors, maybe a big element of those people that are investors that took those cheap rates, who didn't even factor in that the cash flow is the important because what they did against what we've been talking about, and I'm not talking about our clients, I'm talking about the general public, is that they never controlled the cash flow. They were just all about the gain. Yes. The gain. Only one side of the equation. Only one side of the equation. Now, that in itself shows a certain type of... um, psychological attributes to that particular person in fact i think we did a blog a couple of years ago about the four investor profiles yes. you know the speculator the collector um the investor i can't remember what the other one was but it basically it, it identified every investor mm-hmm. that's out there it just which one are you and the reason i say that is because during that 1.992 two percent interest rates not planning for the roll-off, you would have fallen into one of those collectors or speculator profiles. Yeah. Chasing the fad, chasing the boom. If you've deviated away from the plan. 
Correct. Mm. Right. And it's a real unfortunate circumstance. So there'll be some people that are psychologically scarred moving forward. Now, how does that affect the market is the, the million dollar question. Will it be that if the credit environment changes, will people, will those people that are potentially scarred, will they jump back into the market? Mm -hmm. Will they be another investor? Will they be another homeowner? Or will they be a, a renter? Yeah. And carry on. And if so, what does that do to the supply side of things for accommodation moving forward mm. and, and and there's you know statistics when i mean when i say statistics people that have lost their homes um in every cycle uh, one of the things that I'm, i firmly believe is that all these media headlines about the mortgage cliff edge might not actually eventuate because the thing that we need to recognize is first of all uh, we are going into this cycle with a huge amount of savings behind us and minimal credit card debt, debt that is actually increasing at the moment. And the second is that um, unlike yesteryears, the education piece, the information out there, and again, I acknowledge, uh, Steve, what you said about algorithms and, and if you search for the right stuff, uh, you, you get fed the right stuff in, in your newsfeed. That education piece is predominantly available, which is good and bad, uh, the good about it is that if you needed to do something, if you, if you actually searched how you can hold on to your portfolio, how you can correct for today's market, uh, how c how can you not be a statistics? It's all out there. Uh, just search through our podcast, even in our Facebook Lives. We've constantly talked about how to adjust strategies, how to adjust within your portfolio, review uh, simple things, rents, review the fees and charges, review... Um, what else you can do with your mortgages, going back to the same lender and renegotiating. All of those things become paramount so long as you take action, right? And, and, and the biggest thing and the biggest um, psychological mistake that people make uh, is they get into this era for the first time in their journey is that they, they actually bury their heads in sand. They don't take action uh, and they mistake uh, inaction as being prudent uh, in terms of this cycle, it's a good point because when you, especially in today's environment, and if I think back to the different crises that we've that we've invested through, it's always been the one that has took action mm -hmm. that has thrived. Yeah, the ones that who even were in a decent position, and let's say cash flow wasn't an issue, that that did nothing, mm. like didn't consolidate their position or didn't perpetuate their position, or whatever whatever that looked like to them, the people that buried their heads in the sand and just said, she'll be right, or I don't know what to do, and there's not much that's in true. between, yep, that's true. Uh, really didn't come out of it favourably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reality of it is that most people um, that are not so informed do take a knee-jerk approach towards investing, right? And they tend to make a 30-year decision and they spent, what, three minutes, four minutes on it. And of that three, four minutes, maybe three quarters of that is influenced by what the news headlines are, what the Facebook feed is, and um, who you're talking to in All real different life. Different forums. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point because everybody on a forum can be a keyboard warrior. Uh, absolutely. And unfortunately, a lot of the people, I'll rephrase that, some of the people that are on forums are giving very, very... Uh, what could be deemed very important financial advice without any mm. credence or experience yeah. behind There's it and tailored to their circumstances, not yours. Absolutely. And, and the question you've got to ask is, is this a textbook answer or is this a real-life experience answer? And that brings me to the next point, which I didn't even think of, in and around the psychology of, the psychology of investing is there is a massive difference between the textbook absolutely there is theoretical based investing mm. journey or plan versus what actually really happens mm. in real life and that can that, that could go back to our or to your earlier point in and around being methodical and strategic and looking after the cash flow and so many people over the last 2 years or 3 years now that haven't worried about management or cash flow management, and we're not talking about the asset. Because they didn't need to. Because they didn't need to, and this is the point, right? So for those people that who are contemplating 
investing now shouldn't be waiting for rates to to drop back to 2% or 3%. That would be the most unwisest decision that you could possibly do. Mm-hmm. It would be about modelling it out. There's that word, modelling. Um, in and around today's rates and anything below that is a bonus. Is a is a bonus, not the other way mm. around. And, un- and unfortunately, because of everybody's entrepreneurial spirit now, and and entrepreneurial tendencies, because of technology, and everybody can see what the rest of the world is doing, which is a great thing because it inspires people, just like this podcast, hopefully to take action or to be something. Unfortunately, they shortcut the process. Yeah, that's I want what they've got, mm-hmm. and I'm looking for the the shortest journey the shortest distance from where I am to get to that elevated lifestyle or whatever it is to you. Mm. And it's not, it's not how it happens. It's long. It's boring. It's um, full of moments in time that will make you double guess yeah. what you're actually trying to achieve. And then you've got your changing own circumstances, mm. additions to family, changes to jobs, sabbaticals maternity leave whatever it may be then you've got all that those psychological components to play with and so we often refer to and i think we just put it out the other day and and we did a podcast on this thing last year about design a decade mm-hmm. the reason that we created the design a decade was as much to get people thinking as it was to keep close to you those psychological drivers such as achievements to keep you motivated because psychology and motivation go hand in hand. If you set, very short story, if you set yourself this ambitious goal, which is great, but you've done no thought process to the small goals from when you start to that end large goal, you'll be severely disappointed because you're not achieving anything yeah. along the way to keep, your, to keep you motivated. Hence the design of decade where we break it down into the 12-month Three, five, three year, five year and ten year milestones mm-hmm. I should get. And just to be clear, it's not about at the end of ten years living life on the high side. It just happens to be a decade benchmark. Yep. yep. And, and, and it's a rolling decade as well, right? So one of the things that, that we need to strongly acknowledge is that there are so many moving parts to this. It's not, not something that you have a rigid plan uh, to say that, okay, I'm going to buy property number one today and then I'm going to buy one in 12 months, one in 18 months. It doesn't work that way. It, it is fluid and you need to be adjusting the plan according to what's actually happening out in the market and the other moving pieces. In other words, what's happening career-wise, family-wise, the economy. Um, and maybe you know it is time to uh, sit back and take a little bit of a hiatus uh, before you jump back in. Um because you've gone hard. Um, so all of those things really matter uh, when you're investing. And um, one, of the, one of the things that, that um, uh, we've highlighted is that along the way, as the, as the market changes, as your portfolio changes, it is extremely important to con- continually review your position uh, and, and know where you are sitting so that you can then make adjustments to cater for what's unfolding in the market, what what is part of our review processes for our clients, where we absolutely insist that you actually sit down with us at least once a year um, during your acquisition phase so that we can continually correct what's happening out there so that we're not buying properties prematurely or, or more importantly, we're not, we're not taking too long to get ready for the next purchase um, uh, and, and totally miss the market and therefore stunt our growth within that first decade. And then even more importantly, uh, whether it is not buying, but coming back to something that's already existing in your portfolio and, and uh, materializing the full strategy on that on that Tweaking property. it, correct. So if we, on that point in and around being fluid, the fluid investor, um, this is why Vic and I have a real problem with modeling, mm. like a, a long-term modeling. Because it's linear. Correct, and it's not, it's not fluid. It's it's just an assumptive approach ba- based on over ten years, over fifteen years, over twenty years. You know, we'll throw in some variances in there, and this is what it looks like, right? And even with a time, uh, a time 
applied approach. To me, that's a very, very... Well, I'll start... It's good if you're looking for direction to begin with, but I think you should only use it as that. And then as you start to get a little bit of knowledge, then you should not necessarily rip it up, but you should... Adjust it. Adjust it massively, and I'll guarantee that you'll find that it moves 90 degrees Mm -hmm. or thereabouts in terms of that plan. So let's, let's look at an example. Imagine if your timeline on a modelled effect was that you bore one in 12 months and and then two and 18 months after that, and you'd started in 2018. But the plan said you weren't allowed to buy in 2019, 2020. Oops. Yeah, and you, but you'd followed this meticulously yep. and you hadn't got yourself into a position. So you just mo- you've just lost what some people would argue is 10 years' worth of growth in, in three because mm-hmm. the plan said you could not purchase. And I think people need to understand that it's directional. It's not, for a lot of the time, it's not reasonable. Yeah. 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 And it's, so it's very, very important. And, and if I look at our clients now and I compare, I guess, the client mindset back to the GFC, right? Two totally different circumstances, different trigger points, nowhere near each other. But let's just, let's look at the psychology of the investors at, that, at those points. The ones that experienced the GFC, are now super aggressive in the market. Yeah. Super aggressive. To the point where we have to hold them back. Correct, because they know, mm-hmm. right? Those that, I guess, now I'm going to be very general, those that are, let's call it, new to investing, are a little bit more apprehensive, and, and rightly so, because you should never do anything until you're totally comfortable mm. with it. But they're looking at the experienced investors saying, what would you do Yeah. now? And this brings me to the next point, and that is the psychology of your peer group. Mm. If you if you take advice or if you surround yourself and look for answers from a peer group that has A, not achieved what you're wanting to achieve, B, hasn't experienced anything that they're digesting now and giving advice on, then why are you listening to someone who hasn't done it? And that could even be a journalist – not all journalists, sorry. To some, there are some fantastic journalists out there. And we all know the role of most journalists, as I say with a smile on my face. So you could be listening to the journalists who are just doing a job. You could be listening to economists and you'd think, well, hang on, they did 57 years of, I guess, academia mm-hmm. to be able to give what would some would believe a qualified position. Some may argue that point as well. Uh, or you might be listening to people like us or you know, our peers or whatever. But I can wholeheartedly say that the narrative that the people that are giving today will be different in two years' time. Absolutely it will be. Yes. And they will mention nothing of what they said today mm. at all. Full stop, end of story, because it's now new news. Or it's, well, this didn't happen, so our prediction didn't come true. So they, they're over they're over complicating it. Mm. Once again, doesn't matter whether it's the economist, no offense to the economist, doesn't matter whether it's your brother in law from the barbecue or it doesn't matter if it's your best mate or girlfriend in the in your peer group. I think I'm I'm a <laughs> my wife will laugh at this. I'm a big believer in not um, cross pollinating <laughs> is the way I describe it. And and what I mean by that and to my friends listening they'll understand it so i have different sets of group friends so do i yeah interesting yeah Mm. um yeah my fishing mates are my fishing mates my investing mates and um my uh, business mates are another set of Mm. set of groups it's not because one's better than the other it's just that i understand what the conversation yeah, the conversations are different. Is yeah. gonna is gonna be around, mm. um, and th- that way. Uh, sorry to cut you short there, Steve, but that way you're well rounded, right? You're not not pulling too much to one direction because whilst we're talking about investing and you know uh, talking about being in the right group, uh, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the I just got that. Yeah, the uh, the idea is that you need to still be well rounded in the sense that you still need I- I- having those friends that are not property related, that are not business related, keeps you grounded uh, in that sense and make sure that you're not, 
you're not flying too high either. And the conv- I would, I would easily guess that probably fifty percent of my friends don't even know what I do. Agree, agree. Same here. And I don't, and it's not because it's secretive. I just don't want to have the conversation, mm-hmm. and they probably don't either. And I, I suppose uh, the and, and this is speaking for myself. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to then counteract their conviction of the headline grabbing news regarding property regarding interest rates in fact when i when those conversations do come up i tend to agree with them and move on yeah <laughs> i'm i'm probably not as uh I'm nice but i'm not as formal as that i was at a barbecue the other day or two weeks ago and that was what it was so the the different friend group didn't know a lot of these people actually and the the conversation came up about interest rates housing collapse economy collapse blah 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 so quite a few topics in there and i said nothing mm-hmm. and didn't and my wife looked at me as if to say you're going to say anything and then she realized i'm just not and halfway through the conversation i just excused myself and went and got a drink mm. because i didn't want to be involved in that conversation i didn't want to give my two cents because it wasn't worth it they'd already made up their mind on where it was going and in terms of the economy and the housing market and everything else that goes along with it so you don't have to be you don't have to be the gospel preaching person no. at all. Nor you do you have to, uh, ha- you know, put a hundred percent of your energy finding the right click either. No, and that's yeah part of the reason I believe that, and I guess this is uh, you know patting ourselves on the back. Part of the reason why I believe we're so successful as a company, a because we've been around for a long time, and all the other decent st- stuff to create a good business, but it's because we provide a peer community mm-hmm. with our teams for people to talk yeah and and more importantly for the client uh, or equally importantly yep. you know every every employee is, an, is investor. an investor so they're not talking from textbook they're talking from real life yeah and that's very 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 important which now i want to go to another point Vic, because i think we might be running out of time i didn't look at the clock what time we started so the as we mentioned earlier on, in and around, everything is related to cash flow, mm-hmm. right? And whether to hold the asset, to perpetuate the asset, to not live on two-minute noodles or whatever it may mean. So I think, I think neurofinance or behavioural finance is so, so important. And you might think, people might think, oh, what the hell does that mean? What's neurofinance? Is that a new lender? Because <laughs> give me some of that. Um, or is, or is behavioural finance, that's pretty much self-explanatory. But neurofinance is the way that you approach mm-hmm. financing between your ears. Process. Correct. Um, and behavioural finance could be inherited via family. Mm. Yeah, from what your parents did and your parents' parents. Could be cultural. Or habits. Could be habits. Mm. Yep. And that's, well, that's behavioural, right? So it's just a habit that you've formed. And if you don't get that behavioural finance patterns correct it can be a very off-putting journey for you You may Mm -hmm. not reach full potential forget even forget property it just could be you will never have enough yeah and and you'll have people like these in a life who you know start up a business or or get into this uh you build um uh, venture and make the money and then lose it all that's a good example and as you were saying that i was thinking of a someone i know uh, quite close to us that um, they are they can earn mm-hmm. like they can create wealth out of thin air and they, const- they can't hold on to it they can't hold on to it mm-hmm. and they constantly do it though they could grab I don't know a a, a brochure printing mm-hmm. idea they've never had anything to do with it in their life but they will make that business successful and then they will lose the lot. Yeah. So t- tongue and then cheek. they'll do it again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, then I, they'll I do know, it again. I know who you're talking about too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and tongue in cheek, really, you when you're investing, you really should have sticky fingers, right? So what I mean by that is that you got to be able to hold on to the equity. You got to hold on to the cash flow. You got to hold on to the plan, uh, and st- and see it through by making those changes, understanding that there are three things that we simply cannot control: how finance pans out, generally how the economy pans out 
and how the property market itself pans out uh, in, in, in terms of the rest of the cohort as to what they're thinking about property at that point in time. Yep, it's a good point. Let's go back to 2016-17 with APRA pulling the handbrake. Mm-hmm. If at that point in time, it really did stop the market. Once again, the ability and the intent were two different things yeah. as it is today. right? So the ability to get adequate finance was very, very hard. You fast forward to today and most people would blame today's uh, undersupply of housing or, or a roof over people's head because of COVID, mm-hmm. and it's not. No, it's not. We already were undersupplied. It was to that moment in time, and even probably a little bit before that. And if you sit back as a, I guess, someone who has their behavioural finance under control and knows what they're doing, as well as all the other you know, data inputs or, or metrics to become a good investor and looking in hindsight, which is always you know, 100% crystal clear, mm-hmm. as soon as they released the handbrake, you would have just bought anything, e- everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you knew. But the problem is people go, yeah, but what if? But what if it's not that? What if I'm wrong? Yep. Yet you've got all the information in front of you, but now you have these elements of doubt. Mm. Looking for the catch. You're looking for the catch Mm -hmm. and these behavioural patterns around self-doubt or the data's wrong or you've doctor Googled the data and you've found an anomaly. And you'll actually find what you're looking for. You'll find what you're looking for every single time, right? Hence I've got a Garmin watch (laughs) prior to our conversation. (laughs) It's um, Now let's replicate that position today from when they released the handbrake Mm -hmm. or just before it. You fast forward to today, so off the back of what they would call a COVID boom, and have a look at the metrics today. They have a look up at the handbrakes, haven't they? Have a look at the data points today. Tell me, I, I, I dare anybody to challenge me that the metrics and the data points today aren't better than what they were mm-hmm. when they released the handbrake. Yeah. That they aren't better than the beginning of COVID when everybody jumped in. Mm-hmm. Take away the cost of money for just for a minute and people go, yeah, but that's a big part of it. No, it's not. We're back at normal rates. Yeah. So if that final component comes through, and we did think last week's, last month's podcast around those three components that will trigger mm. the asset class, if we get two of the three, go back and listen to it, I would... I would love someone to argue the point with me that the components today aren't better than back to those two three, those two moments in time. Yeah, yep. And so, but the biggest thing is that are uh, what are you doing to prepare yourself for this eventuality? Because it will happen, right? We don't know whether it's next month or next year, but Correct. it will happen. Yeah. Uh, so, what are you doing from a psychology point of view, which then flows down to the action items, right? You know, getting finance ready, taking stock of where you are with things, accessing your equity. All of those things, what, uh, you know, they, they, they form a really important part of whether the money, the wealth, as the cycle changes, flows to you or to someone else. So the point there that you made, Vic, which I think is super mega important, as my kids would say, mega, is what are you doing right now? Are you a shoulda, woulda, coulda? Mm-hmm. Right, if you know, if you really do believe what's around the corner, and the corner might be way down the road, but it's coming, yep. what are you doing about it now? You may be in a position that you can't do anything now, but you're making all the right moves to be in the position for when you can. Yep. As opposed to, well, I'll just wait. And it's, it's not a matter of timing the market, right? No, yeah. no it's not. It, it's a matter of being prepared. That's what it comes down to. He caught me with a mouthful of water then. I'm looking at you to say, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it isn't water, actually. It's, it's gin. It, gin. <laughs> gin. Yeah, stick around for another four hours, see how that goes. It, uh, but, and, that, and that once again comes back to, you, to the psychology of investing. You're either going to wait to start to see some runs on the board from other people and yep. then you'll jump in. or you'll You want be, proof. Yeah, right. you want proof. Yeah? Or you'll be doing it now. You'll mm. be making or, and doing whatever you need to do to Get yourself in a position to be able to execute, whether that's tomorrow, next week, or next year, 
or whatever it is for you. But unfortunately, a lot of people are going to wait. They want the proof. Mm. And that's when you'll get the barbecue investor and the taxi driver yep. start to give the advice. Yeah, when, when that starts to happen, in most cases, you've left your rent too late. Depending on how long the, the upside, mm-hmm. I guess, is. And what people need to understand is th- this is a normal market now. Yeah. This isn't a buyer's market or a seller's market, as we've mentioned before. It's a normalised market. There are some going sideways, some up, some down. But there's, there's circulation within mm-hmm. the, the asset class. Yes, we've got some factors that are perhaps um, highlighting certain components of the market. And you could say, okay, low stock on market might be one of them. We've got a rental crisis. We've got immigration. We've got higher rates. We've got... Cost of building. Cost of building. We've got a lack of credit fluidity within the system and you could you could pull up a a4 sheet of reasons why you should or why you shouldn't be doing it anything and that comes back down to your own behavioral patterns mm-hmm. in and around finance because if you took the finance out of it what would stop you it comes back to the person doesn't it but yeah but yeah. think about it if, if there was no and, and this is, I guess, how important the fo- understanding your relationship with debt. This is why it's so important. If finance wasn't an issue, so you didn't have to pay the money mm-hmm. or you didn't have to pay it back or it was 0% interest rates for 50 years locked in, whatever it may be, what would stop you? Virtually nothing except your own fear, right? And, and that, that brings to, to, to the table anyway what happened during COVID when money was really cheap my point and and there was lots of disposable income because we couldn't travel what did people do jump onto the um, the um, thing that they were always wanting to do which was invest or buy their own home and it is always something that they're always going to want to do mm. is to have that piece of dirt or that call their own to call their own eventually but they've got to get there right yep. so that brings me to a, another really point interesting point i believe anyways is the influence of changing cultures will dictate certain segments of the market. Yeah? So if we just took some really sort of obscure examples, what's happening in the eastern suburbs of Sydney yeah, versus what's happening in the, I don't know, the, the western suburbs of Sydney is two almost totally different markets. Yep. Yeah. Or even both price wise and movement wise. Yeah, and just for those people that don't understand those markets, one's uber expensive, and the other side is the affordable corridors. Or if you even, maybe that's in one sta- state, but if you took what's happening in um, the middle income brackets of Sydney versus what's happening in the middle income brackets of Brisbane, mm-hmm. what's happening in Perth, what's happening in Adelaide, the cultural, I guess, differences in those in those localised economies is also driving the asset quite yeah. quite differently. And because now, once again, because of technology, some of those cultural differences now can spill out mm-hmm. to the rest of the country and potentially drive those markets based on you know price brackets and, and incomes and, and what have you. Now, in case I've lost you, or what I mean by that is if you look at new, new immigrants to the country, they're driven – and they want to succeed and they want to get want to get ahead. Thanks to technology, that's allowed them to do so. Whereas potentially they couldn't do it before. You can now buy from Sydney in Perth. Yep. You can now buy from Brisbane into into Tasmania because it's it's now been brought to your attention, I guess, that you can. COVID's had something to do with that other than technology. The clunkiness of the asset and the transaction has diminished. Mm -hmm. somewhat thanks to the different document handling software that there is an id identification but if you go back 23 years ago when we first started it's very clunky but the cultural the cultural differences and abilities weren't apparent Mm. it was more isolated yep it was to that area and that area alone so that's why you could see certain areas doing better or worse than than other areas according to the data just by pure volume or lack of of different transactions Mm -hmm. and now that we are a democratized asset class and you can buy anywhere without leaving the seat of your 
car, literally, if you've got the right team around you, the whole world or the whole of the country is open up to you in in um, as long as we're taking into account all the other you know, contributing factors mm-hmm. to make wise decisions because now you know you can. And I know that sounds like, well, that's a pretty obvious thing, Steve, but the consumer sentiment and the cons- in, in combination with the ability makes a huge difference yep. to markets. Yep. It does. And, and it's also because of, of um, these factors, it shifts the consumer sentiment quite rapidly as well. Uh, which in the yesteryears when we were investing, uh, you know, a, a change in the tempo of the market usually translated to one or two quarters because we are reliant on the back of the magazines uh, to get our data mm. uh, because getting getting data from the data houses was way too expensive uh, for the retail investor. Uh, today, you just have to Google things and uh, there you are. It can be dangerous as well. It can it? be very dangerous as well, yeah. So I guess um, you know, with with the way the market is changing, the way um, this cycle is changing, and the phase of investing is changing, it's really important to understand where you stand as an investor, uh, whether you're starting out or whether you've already got a portfolio. And uh, one of the things that we do for existing clients is obviously we we do that review process. Um, uh, and and uh, if you are new to this, one of the things that I would guide you to is download the um, Design Your Decade ebook uh, from our website, uh, and we'll put this in the show notes as well. Uh, put a link in the show notes, and um, if you then wanted to reach out and have a chat with us to discuss how you can take advantage of this market, or whether it is actually safe for you to 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 actually jump into the, uh, a market that's changing rapidly like it is right now. Just reach out to us uh, on Facebook or through our website. There is a bit of a process. You, you've got to speak with Melissa uh, first. She's a very, very seasoned investor. And uh, her role is to get you ready to get the best of either mine or Steve's time uh, so that we can then guide you to say, well, this is what you need to do. And these are the things that you would want to do with your existing portfolio before you get started or in conjunction with uh, adding to that to that portfolio uh, so that we can then actually take a forward look of the next 12 months, three mu- uh, three years uh, and five years within the portfolio. Really can't project a lot further than that, which is really important to understand because if you project too far out, you are speculating. You need to keep adjusting and remembering that this is a rolling decade and we need to drop that decade down into its milestones so that uh, we are able to adjust the course of the uh, the portfolio, the adjust the types of properties you're investing and the restructuring of your mortgages so that you are actually safe and take full advantage of the market as it unfolds. Absolutely. Now, Vic, as you mentioned, um, everybody can download, jump on to the website and download the ebook. And I believe we're also uh, making available our portfolio tracker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the amount of times I know your numbers. Yeah, know your numbers. The amount of times that that I speak to people and they just don't have any type of tracking solution. Now, this isn't uh, some you know dart, uh, sorry, table-driven, graph-driven spreadsheet. It's literally just an Excel spreadsheet being tabulized for you. If you want a copy of that, uh, just keep an eye out on the socials. We'll be putting the link out there. It is absolutely crucial to the, the money management and the cash flow management of your portfolio, not the household budget, just that portfolio. That's it, Vic, for another fortnight, week, month. Yep, and we'll, we'll uh, see you again this time with Phil. Yeah, and actually, I think it's next week we'll be releasing something with Phil. So make sure you tune in. And if you could please leave a review for us, it means a lot. There's a lot of people in behind the scenes that have a great deal to do with this and we love to see what the, the feedback is, good or bad. So up until then, we will speak to you later podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.